What is up, y'all? This is Mr. Winchell coming back to you with our period six review video for our 2020 exam series. Uh, period six is going to be a time of great change in American history uh, as the nation is going to uh, look to rebuild uh, the economy and the social structure after the Civil War uh, and go, undergo uh, America's massive industrialization, uh, massive industrial growth and changes. Uh, period six is going to take us from 1865, so right there at the conclusion, the tail end of the Civil War, uh, all the way through 1896 with the election of William McKinley uh, as an exclamation point to a time in which uh, the industrial capitalists have uh, wielded, yielded an enormous amount of influence over American society, politics, uh, and the economy as a whole. Uh, so period six is going to uh, potentially play a key role uh, in, in this year's AP exam. Uh, in all year AP exams. Uh, our previous two DBQs actually had roots in period six. Uh, two years ago, the prompt being the the causes of, of imperialism and America's expansion overseas, which has roots here in period six with the economic growth and the societal population growth. Uh, last year's DBQ, of course, covered the political change of the progressive era uh, and a lot of the, the changes that the, uh, progressives are going to try to resolve, try to work on uh, in, the, in the 1910s uh, which is more of a period seven thing, are going to be problems that are created because of, of what we're going to talk about today with, with period six. So uh, any time that provides such great change, such great societal debate on the role of government, on the economy, on citizenship is always ripe for uh, challenging and open-ended broad questions. Uh, and especially this, this period six is, is really the time in which America grows into the industrial giant. Uh, that we see playing such a big role uh, on the world stage uh, in the next century. So monumental time period, College Board breaks it into three, three key concepts. The first deals with economic growth, uh, what comes from uh, changes in technology, changes in production, changing in markets. This is going to lead to a huge increase in industrial capitalism in the U.S. Uh, so the 6.1 key concepts are really going to work through um, what's being produced, how it's being produced, and how technology changes on that. Uh, and then also going hand in hand with this key concept here below is the questions about what to do now, right? What, what's the proper amount of regulation for business? What's the proper way to treat workers? What do we do during financial downturns like the Panic of 1873, 1893? Uh, and then also with the, this uh, continuity really about transportation and infrastructure and the government's role there. Uh, this, the second key concept for period six is going to talk about the migrations that associate this industrial growth. Uh, this is going to be twofold. Uh, the overseas or international immigration that's going to um, come into the United States in, in massive numbers because of the industrial jobs that are available. We're going to call this uh, in the grand scheme of American history, new immigration, as opposed to the old immigration, which takes place before the Civil War. Uh, but it's not just immigrants that are coming to America as well. It's also internal migrations that are taking place as people are moving west in search of opportunities on the cattle frontier, the farming frontier, the mining frontier, uh, as well as people from rural areas moving into cities. Uh, the cities become centers of economic activity um, to a large extent by the end of this time period. Uh, so much so that 20 years later, by 1920, more Americans are going to live in cities than on farms for the first time in American history. And that process is really spread up, uh, sped up, excuse me, via urbanization during the Gilded Age. Um, the third key concept the College Board would like you to know is is kind of twofold it's it's the way in which the gilded age social order manifests itself with ideologies that support the idea that the rich should be really really rich uh and ideas that oppose the idea that uh we should just leave people alone to make as much money as they want um the, these questions about citizenship about corruption we're talking about some political machines and the like are all going to find their way into this uh gilded age production of movements public reform movements and political debates and the like so that's what we have to work with uh, i broke the unit for you into five key topics uh first we'll talk about the industrial revolution and industrial capitalism what this looks like for the u.s production for u.s industries uh and the second thing we'll talk about is uh the responses, society's responses to industrial change. Um, how does the labor movement respond? Uh, how does the government try to respond with some attempts at reform? Uh, and last, but of course not least, uh, how are these ideas justified? Uh, we'll talk there about things like social Darwinism and the gospel of wealth. Uh, the third key idea to talk through today is immigration and urbanization. They go really hand in hand as many of the immigrants, most of the immigrants 
They're going to come to the U.S. in this time period are going to settle in urban cities, which is going to really transform the urban landscape as well. Uh, fourth, we'll speak on very briefly uh, the last West, the closing of the frontier, um, some of the impacts there and the, the attempts at the new South, although much of the South is going to still look like the old South. Uh, and last, we'll kind of wrap up with politics of the Gilded Age, which are going to take a backseat as both political parties are going to be a little hesitant to upset the apple cart, so to speak, and just leave people to their to their um, existences, especially understanding that this takes place in the 30 years after the Civil War. Uh, so this desire by, by both parties to not really cause any political turmoil because of what the nation had just gone through. So let's go ahead and get started with the, our discussion about industri the industrial revolution that takes place and with it, industrial capitalism. Now, there's a couple of reasons why America is going to experience great economic growth in the years after the Civil War. The first is natural resources. Uh, the United States is blessed with an abundant amount of natural resources, whether that be uh, iron ore for steel or oil for the oil industry. Uh, but the U.S. has, for the most part, every natural resource it needs within the U.S. So all the things that, that are required for industrialization, for industrial production, none of that needs to be outsourced. The second is... Uh, favorable government policies. Uh, the U.S. government has been pro-business um, with with things like Dartmouth versus Woodward, um, which allow for businesses the idea of contract rights uh, with tariffs over time that have been in support of American industry. This is going to continue after the Civil War. Of course, the Republicans were in power during the Civil War and put in place some pro-business policies like a Pacific Railway Act to pay for infrastructure, a moral tariff. Uh, to to protect American industry and raise funds. So because the Republicans are in power through the Civil War and then shortly after, we see a lot of policies being put in place that are going to benefit big business. The third reason is a growing population. Right? The U.S. has a, a, a massively increasing population, uh, and that provides two things. It provides labor and it provides markets uh, for these goods. Uh, the fourth is new sources of power as, as America is going to undergo a transformation towards more um, uh, oil powered, uh, petroleum powered, as opposed to the steam power that we saw a generation before during the market revolution, uh, as well as other uh, improvements uh, in machinery, like the Bessemer process to produce steel, advances in railroads, etc., that are all going to encourage more industrial growth. Uh, the next is improved transportation, which goes hand in hand with the one uh, right above it, as America is going to become much more interconnected due to the huge advances in railroads. Uh, and with this improved transportation becomes, uh, just like it did in the market revolution, uh, an increased ability to move goods to where they are in demand and thus increase uh, um, production. Uh, we see improvements in communication. Uh, by the very tail end of this time period, we'll have the telephone, uh, but just growing uh, infrastructure for how we uh, relay messages back and forth is going to play a big role in why we industrialize so quickly. And the last is wars. Uh, wars almost always lead to industrial growth afterwards as, a, as the society transitions war production into um, consumer production or business production. Uh, and this is, no, this is no different as some of the, the civil war policies that I have, uh, alluded to earlier are going to play a very direct role in what comes next. Now, some of the effects of the Industrial Revolution, of this growth of industrial capitalism, uh, I think this is the kind of uh, response that you might see on a DBQ is evaluate the effects of the Industrial Revolution after the Civil War. Uh, we see a big increase in the wage gap. The rich get richer. Uh, the poor also are going to become uh, better off, albeit slightly. So the, the wage gap is going to increase. Another uh, effect is the creation for the first time in American history of an industrial giants of these, these industrial capitalists who can go by one name, like Rockefeller or Carnegie or Vanderbilt, um, who, who wield outsized political influence, who, who have a ton of influence on the economic sphere of the country, but also the political sphere, as we see the creation of monopolies, for example, uh, and with it, uh, these questions about how much is too much. Uh, we see an increase in corruption, because anytime there's a huge increase in, in uh, economic production and capability, uh, and money being gained, that also then yields corruption. Uh, we've seen increasing consumerism as people in these new cities, the middle class and upper class in cities, are going to embrace this new lifestyle with entertainment, uh, with parks, with museums, with shows, with sports eventually. Uh, and then another outcome uh, very clearly that goes hand in hand with the one above it is a huge increase in immigration for these jobs. Uh, and then because those jobs are largely going to be found in cities and factories, a huge increase in urbanization as well. So this is some of the causes and some of the consequences, if you will, of the Gilded Age Industrial Revolution.
Uh, now, it's going to be often referred to as the Gilded Age, which makes a lot of sense. I think it's a pretty apt title. Uh, the, the, the phrase, the term gilded means a thinly covered and a, a layer of gold. Uh, and that's a pretty appropriate name for this time period because things look so much better on the surface. Right? America's producing more, and there's more wealth and more rich people and more progress. Uh, but really that, that gold is only a very thin layer at the top of society where many of the people down below are still struggling with tenant housing and corruption and filth and poverty and need. Uh, and that's going to then lead to some questions about what American society should look like. So uh, starting with the industries, there's four key industries we should know, uh, rail, oil, steel, and banking. Uh, we really see a huge increase in the rail uh, expansion of railroads that takes place because of the Pacific Railway Act, which is of course passed by the Republicans in Congress during the Civil War. Um, and then subsequent government subsidies that are going to keep making the railroad expansion possible. What that means is the federal government's going to give a lot of their land uh, to the railroad companies in order in exchange the railroad companies will, will build out railroads and have the opportunity to sell the land along those railroads to make their profit uh, what this leads to is a huge increase in in rail expansion uh, west specifically uh, but this is also going to lead to some negative outcomes like the panic of 1873 uh, and the panic of 1893 which are both largely caused by over expansion of rail as well as a couple other key industries uh, the names to know for uh, railroad expansion, railroad um, monopolists, if you will, are Cornelius Vanderbilt, not quite the name, uh, who is going to work to create a railroad monopoly uh, that's going to connect a lot of the northeastern cities like New York uh, with the West and places like Chicago. Uh, and Jay Gould, who's going to become incredibly rich by buying up uh, struggling railroads uh, and turning them into much more successful um, uh rail companies. Uh, some of the things that are going to help railroads ad advance and become a big business, first is standardized gauges. The railroads are going to uh, work to create a standard width by which all rail companies operate, uh, which is going to then allow for rail transfer, rail transportation to be a little more efficient and effective. Uh, but rail railroad companies can be early users of some of the methods that, that are going to later become illegal for creating monopolies with things like special rates or, or providing basically bribes to businesses to use their railroads, uh, pooling and consolidation, which means putting multiple rail companies that look like they're different companies under one uh, kind of governing board so that they can uh, get around some of the restrictions on, on monopolies and the like. Um, our Supreme Court rules, there are some attempts to regulate uh, rail, which are important. Munn versus Illinois is a, a landmark Supreme Court case in which the courts rule that Illinois can regulate rail that goes through Illinois. Uh, that gets overturned seven years later uh, with Wabash versus Illinois, which rules that unfortunately uh, for Illinois, uh, railroads count as an interstate commerce uh, business and therefore only the federal government can regulate interstate commerce and that therefore railroads will go unregulated. Uh, and that is, that is somewhat alleviated with the passage of the Interstate Commerce Act in the 1880s as well. Uh, which is designed to use what's called the Interstate Commerce Commission to work to regulate rail. But for the most part, rail operates uh, in a, from a pretty unregulated standpoint for much of the Gilded Age. Second industry is oil. Uh, the name, of course, you know there is John Rockefeller. Uh, Rockefeller is going to use what's called horizontal integration, which I'll speak on in a little bit, but buying out his competitors and bribing railroads to use his business, to use his oil in their rail. Um, and, and he eventually moved to vertical integration by, by buying out railroad companies and, and transporting the oil himself via pipelines. Um, he's going to use a bunch of, of shady and corrupt um, practices to exert enormous influence over the oil industry, uh, leading to a couple of things, maybe a negative. Uh, Ida Tarbell is going to publish the history of Standard Oil. Uh, we're going to consider her one of the muckraking journalists who works to expose the corruption of the Gilded Age in which she tries to show society what Rockefeller is really all about and how he got that rich on the backs of hardworking people. Uh, but on a more positive side, Rockefeller, like some of the people after this, are go he's going to uh, engage in a, a serious amount of philanthropy, uh, forming the Rockefeller Foundation, which still serves to this day to provide scholarships for people all over the, all over the country, as well as he formed, created the University of Chicago, uh, which is one of the better private schools in the country to this day. Uh, the next important industry is steel, of course, uh, championed by Andrew Carnegie, uh, 
Uh, he's going to use this, this trademark, this landmark Bessemer steel process, which allows him to, to make steel much more efficiently, much more effectively, much cheaper, and a much higher quality. Um, he's going to uh, really uh, champion the idea of vertical integration, which again, I'll speak on a little bit, uh, but taking a raw material from, from its, its very infancy all the way to it being created as a manufactured good and then distributed and sold without involving any other third parties um, to create what's called the economy of scale. He realized that I can produce more steel than anybody else. So I don't need to charge as much uh, because I can sell more of it because I have more of it. And that will then lead to my competitors falling off because they cannot keep up with how much I could produce. Uh, this economy of scale is going to lead him to become one of the richest men in America. Eventually in 1900, he's going to sell uh, his steel company to JP Morgan, who will uh, combine a couple of steel companies uh, into what's called U.S. Steel. Uh, and then he's going to then turn around much like Rockefeller and he's going to embrace what's called the gospel of wealth uh, and give a bunch of his money away to philanthropic opportunities like scholarships, like music programs, like universities as well. Uh, and the last big industry to know is banking. Uh, J.P. Morgan really becomes the name to be associated here with banking and finance of the Gilded Age. J.P. Morgan is going to use his uh, economic influence to fund mergers and corporations or, or combining businesses, buying out struggling businesses, uh, giving loans to even the government, the Panic of 1907. Um, but JP Morgan really is going to be a lot of the, the assets, the liquidity behind all these, these uh, economic combinations and, and, and movements during the Gilded Age. So those are the four key industries that you should know. A lot of this is responsible from, uh, as College Board would ask you to know, technological advancements during the Gilded Age, what, what technology evolves. Uh, but one thing which is kind of a technology and kind of not is scientific management. Uh, first championed by a man named Frederick Taylor, so often gets associated with the phrase Taylorism. So you can use scientific management and Taylorism interchangeably. What this is going to argue is that uh, businesses should cut costs by ensuring that their workers do the simplest task possible to do so in the most efficient way. The idea here is that that we talked in the in the market revolution about interchangeable parts about being able to replace a machine by not replacing the entire machine but just by replacing one single part the example i was using class is if i'm driving home from work and my tire uh goes flat i don't need to buy a new car i could just get a new tire that's an interchangeable part uh, and then my car still works just fine uh, what taylorism introduces is the idea of interchangeable humans uh, so it's the next advance in the industrial production idea and that if we make sure that our our workers are doing the simplest task possible, then it becomes incredibly easy to replace them. And once our workers are replaceable, then it, uh, then the industrial giants are able to, to pay terrible wages, to have terrible working conditions with the understanding that there's all these immigrants coming in uh, and there's not a whole lot of, of bargaining power for the working class, uh, hence Taylorism, uh, working to improve the efficiency of workers, timed tasks, the idea that you're gonna work very hard in short bursts, uh, on a very specific task to increase production. Uh, but that's not it. We also see a bunch of other technological advancements in the Gilded Age, like mechanized tractors, which are going to really uh, increase farm production, uh, grain elevators, which is going to make it easier to, to move farm goods in and out, which is going to only then encourage farmers to produce more and more and more. Uh, and then, of course, as I already talked about, the Bessemer process, uh, which is going to allow for the mass production of steel. Now, steel is going to play a role in a whole bunch of other industries which is why the Bessemer process is so important. Steel is going to allow for more railroads, for stronger bridges, um, for skyscrapers, for America to build upward. So steel production is going to play a huge role in a whole bunch of other stuff that matters a whole lot. Now, a lot of the ways, a lot of the ways in which these people that I mentioned go from being rich to being really rich is uh, through business consolidation, through taking a business and working to increase its reach, working to increase its influence, working to increase its capacity until you have fewer and fewer and fewer competitors. Uh, because at the end of the day, in a capitalistic society, the thing that keeps prices down, the thing that keeps things fair is competition. Right? If there's four companies that are all competing for your business, then they have to keep things fair and they have to price things appropriately because otherwise there is uh, no reason for you to support that company. But once competition gets removed, well, then it's a whole other question about, well, then, then they can charge you whatever they want because there's no competition. 
now trusts is one way in which businesses are consolidated, uh, putting a variety of companies together to work together despite it not being the same company. Um, holding companies is another way in which these businesses are going to get around some of these restrictions. Uh, it's just one company that owns stock in a bunch of companies and therefore has a controlling interest in a lot of them so they can maneuver things the way they want. Uh, we see Rockefeller doing a lot of this with the uh, uh, competing oil companies. Uh, and the two ones that are, are most uh, uh, important to understand how we go to Asia are vertical integration, uh, which we see with Carnegie, for example, uh, taking a iron ore, mining it in a Carnegie plant, turning it into steel in a Carnegie plant, selling it from steel uh, as, as Carnegie still controls the selling process. Uh, so owning the entire aspect of production of any business from start all the way to finish without involving any other third parties to maximize profits. And then horizontal integration, buying out your competitors, uh, working together to form a monopoly so that you can remove your competitors and then have uh, access to the entire market. Uh, so those are the four ways you should know which businesses are consolidated. Uh, here's a fun visual that I think always helps. You can pause the video if you need to take it a look a little longer. Uh, but it demonstrates both. Uh, it's one I've used in class often of, of resource to distribution, taking the whole thing that way is vertical, whereas horizontal is buying out people that do similar things as you do so that you can remove competition that way. Now, all this crazy industrial growth is going to lead to a lot of people getting really, really, really rich. But it's going to cause a lot of people to start questioning, like, what about the rest of society? What about the working class? What about, um, what about those that don't have access to these kinds of opportunities? And these responses to industry are key, according to the key concepts, in that really they're threefold. Right? Response one is the labor movement. Response two is work, working to reform the problems. But response three is also the justification, right? as some of those who are in elite power are going to find ways to justify why they have all the power and the money and influence that they have. Uh, first example, though, is labor unions, as we just talked about with Taylorism. Uh, the idea is that workers become interchangeable. So the only real power that the working class has is in numbers. Uh, as, as the labor gets less and less skilled and less and less value, uh, and then therefore less and less paid, um, they realize that, that if they are individually replaceable because of Taylorism, because of the de-skilling de of labor, the only way they can have any bargaining power, any, any sort of influence to push back on uh, big business is with numbers, with labor unions. So these labor unions are going to uh, form for a couple of reasons. Reason one is this de-skilling of labor I just spoke on. Uh, reason two is, is these terrible working conditions and these factories that they're going to be asked to work in. Reason three is a huge influx of immigrants, right, which makes the working class even more uh, replaceable. And reason four is the fact that they are getting paid terribly and have no benefits and no sort of health care plans or any of those things. Uh, now, the real goal of the labor unions is to uh, create what's called collective bargaining, which means I'm not going to ask for a raise for me. We are going to ask for a raise for all of us because there is power in numbers. Uh, the thing that every labor union always is always going to demand to the Gilded Age and later threefold, uh, higher wages, shorter working, shorter working hours, uh, and safer working conditions. Uh, now, those are the three things that are kind of a good thing to have in your back pocket for any sort of labor union question or the reference of any labor union document. Uh, and the ways in which they're going to do this is with political action and arguing for political change. Uh, it's labor unions that uh, are incredibly influential in getting uh, Chinese immigration excluded or, or banned being in the 1880s uh, to keep that racial group from competing for industrial jobs. Uh, labor unions are going to create things that are called closed shops, which are going to insist to the, the ownership class that you only hire people who are in this labor union. Uh, labor unions are going to uh, do work slowdowns, to picket, to boycott, to sabotage work equipment. But the most common labor union tactic then and now is the strike is is uh threatening and then following through on that threat to no longer work until their conditions are met now if if, a, if one person goes on strike that's not that's not influential that's not um it's not effective uh because one person is replaceable as we've already talked about but if everybody goes on strike right, the, all the workers in the plant then that might lead then to some some more efficacy so some, some more control or influence now, the two big ones to know are the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor. The Knights of Labor come first. Uh, they have very open membership, meaning that skilled and unskilled workers can join. Uh, only reason you can't only reason you can't join is if you were Chinese. Uh, 
And much like other labor unions, they're going to ask for an eight-hour workday, uh, child labor laws, uh, trying to keep kids out of work, which of course is is twofold. A, it's probably better for the kids and not work in factories. Uh, but B, it helps make their work less replaceable. Uh, the third thing they're going to ask for is antitrust laws or laws that take away the ability of these big businesses to consolidate into monopolies. Um, and they're going to be very idealistic. Uh, they're going to use arbitration and strikes to try to get their way. Uh, they're going to have a, a short amount of influence, and then they're going to decline in influence after the Haymarket Square riot. But they're a very important early labor union formed by Terence Powderly. Now, the longer-term successful labor union is the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. They're going to be formed about 20 years later, uh, later in the Industrial Revolution, later in the Gilded Age, uh, with a little more understanding for kind of how to work the system, which is one of the reasons why they, they last longer. They're founded by Samuel Gompers, the Gomp, uh, and they're going to be much more limited membership. Uh, skilled workers with a trade, with a craft, those workers that, that have – uh, a type of skill that is harder to replace. Uh, they're going to exclude women. They're going to exclude minorities. They're going to exclude any foreign laborers. Uh, and their platform is going to be just stick to the basics, right? Better wages, shorter work, work day, better working conditions, and no kids. They're not going to try to ask for the things like antitrust laws and cooperative and all these idealistic reforms. They're going to be much more simplistic to uh, the day-to-day -day existence of the laboring class. Uh, they're going to also use collective bargaining. We talked about an arbitration. Uh, they're going to work a lot uh, to to lobby politically, to work to ha have politicians to support them. Uh, they're going to start trying to do things like voting as a block, right? If you can give us these things as a politician, then the entire labor union will support you. Um, they're going to try to avoid walkouts and strikes, understanding by the late 1880s that strikes almost always end in a victory, at least in the short term, for big business. Um, and they're going to try to make, make sure that they're not associated with the radicalism and the violence that some other labor unions like the Knights of Labor or other group like the International Workers of the World, the Wobblies, are associated with. They're going to try to be seen as, as the more upstanding of the labor unions because they're skilled membership and because they're not embracing some of the uh, extremism that other groups do. So those are the two to know. Uh, as we can see, the Knights of Labor have a huge increase in their uh, membership which is going to have, then have a, a steep decline in their membership. Uh, this is for a couple of reasons. Reason one is that it's unskilled laborers. Any, anybody is welcome. Uh, so that's why they're able to grow so quickly. And then we're going to see the Haymarket Square riot, uh, which is worth noting, but not a whole lot of time to cover right now, uh, which is going to then cause a, a huge decrease in their credibility and thus their membership. Whereas the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, is going to be uh, – have a slightly slower increase, more steady, and because it's it's skilled, it's – not supposed to be open to anybody. Uh, and they're not working for drastic change right now, but change over time the benefits of the working class. Now, a couple of strikes that are uh, important that we're supposed to know. Most often, uh, these labor unions are going to strike when their wages are cut. Uh, when they go from making, say, four bucks a day to two bucks a day. And it's like, what? Well, nobody asked me. I didn't say you could cut my wages. That's not fair. We're going to go on strike. Uh, the first to know is the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, uh, which is going to be broken up by federal troops. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes is in office at this time. Uh, he is a pro-business Republican, and he is going to uh, not be okay with the idea that our, our rail cars are being held up by a strike, sends federal troops, forces the strikers back to work, uh, which is not great. The second is the Haymarket Square Riot, which I just talked about a minute ago. It's a protest on behalf of labor. In Chicago, an anarchist group is going to also get involved. It's going to throw a bomb. The bomb's going to explode, kill some police officers. It's going to set off a whole bunch of violence back and forth. Unions end up getting blamed for this violence, even though it's not unions that were responsible for this violence. Uh, and it's going to be this that causes a ton of the loss and credibility for the Knights of Labor. Uh, the next important one is the Homestead Strike, which is going to take place at uh, a Carnegie, one of Carnegie's many steel plants. Um, in the case of this one, uh, the strikers are going to go on strike. Uh, Henry Clay Frick, who's the guy in charge of the plant, is going to hire some scabs or some replacement workers to uh, to take their place. The strikers are going to refuse to let this happen. The strikers actually take over the plant. They hold the plant for multiple months. Uh, private detectives are hired to go and, and stop the strike. They're unsuccessful. And eventually the state militia is called in, again, on the side of big business, forcing the workers back to work. 
Uh, and the fourth is the Pullman strike for the Pullman rail car company. Uh, the company cuts wages, uh, but not, they don't cut rent. So with less money to be made and rent staying the same, the workers are very upset. They go on strike. They refuse to let the Pullman rail cars be shipped out. Uh, and the way the government in this case responds is by attaching mail cars, mail rail trucks um, to the trains. And that, therefore, the strikers can't stop that because it's illegal to stop the distribution of the mail. So what we see in all these instances, though, is that at every turn, the federal government is going to side, and the state governments are going to side with big business at the expense of labor, which is one of the reasons why labor unions are are ineffective in having their demands met during the Gilded Age. So those are the labor movement. I think a, a worthwhile question might be: to what extent was labor successful uh, in having its needs or having having its demands met during the Gilded Age? And I think the answer there is to a small extent, right? Uh, as at the end of this time period, we still see uh, big business having enormous control over the laboring class. But there are some attempts at reform at fixing these problems. The first is the Interstate Commerce Act, which is going to allow the federal government the authority to investigate railroads. Uh, it's mostly symbolic at first, um, and the, the federal government does very little actually to regulate railroads, but the act is there, which kind of becomes a precursor for what happens later in the progressive era. Uh, the second is the Sherman Antitrust Act, passed three years later, which makes it illegal to form trusts uh, and gives the federal government the power to investigate trusts. Uh, unfortunately, the Sherman Antitrust Act ends up being used more against labor than against industry, um, as the federal government is going to decide that labor unions going on strike also stops interstate commerce, uh, also counts as a trust or or uh, working together in a way that stops business, stops commerce. Uh, but both of these things become the precursors for later legislation, which regulates business. What this means is you can use this for contextualization for a prompt later on the increasing size of the government. Or you can use this for contextualization um, for progressive reforms later. Right? There's a lot of things you can use this for whether or not they are necessarily effective. No, but they are important and they provide valid back information for the beginnings of the federal government beginning to regulate business. Now, more importantly, uh, is is the idea of the justifications of the social order. What? Yes, people are incredibly rich, but it's okay. This is why, is what I mean here. Uh, so we see a bunch of arguments, really one key argument, being used to justify the success of the wealthy. Uh, and that argument is called social Darwinism. And what this argument is going to say is that like the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts, they're rich because they are the most fit. Right? And that if we believe in Darwinism, societally speaking, right, and the idea of, of survival of the fittest, that you either evolve and adapt or you die, um, then we should apply the same thinking and the same logic to business. Right? And that those that are working in a factory job, it's because they didn't make the same type of good choices that those who are owning the factory made. And thus, to get in the way of this process, to artificially support the lower classes at the expense of the rich is actually uh, – counterintuitive to evolution and thus it's bad for human society as a whole. So the idea of social Darwinism is that the business class can use any business tactics to prosper because those tactics are available to anybody and if people made better choices then we'd all be that rich. The second justification is called the Horatio Alger myth uh, which is going to play a role in Gilded Age society and culture. It's a series of books that are published uh, in which this immigrant named Horatio Alger uh, comes to America, works really hard, becomes rich and successful, and then makes the world around him a better place. It gives this this false sense of hope that all it takes in America to get rich, rich, like a Carnegie, is to just work really hard. Uh, when in reality, those rags to riches stories are just that, and they're stories, uh, and there's very, very little truth to them whatsoever. Uh, the, the next justification, though, is the gospel of wealth, and this is going to be championed by Andrew Carnegie. Uh, he's going to advocate philanthropy, uh, arguing that it's the duty of those who are rich to, to earn a bunch of money, make a bunch of money, and then spend a bunch of money, not in handouts, not in handouts, but in, in resources, right, in ladders, so to speak, to put down to the lower chunks of society so that if people want to uplift themselves, they have the opportunities to do so. This looks, for in Carnegie's case, like uh, Carnegie Mellon, a fantastic university, uh, Carnegie Hall. 
uh, a performing arts center in New York City, as well as Carnegie Libraries. I, uh, he gives money for hundreds of libraries throughout the United States so the people have access to education and knowledge so they can better themselves and then pull themselves up if they so choose. However, a couple of things are going to challenge or not justify the social order, but, but push back and challenge the social order of the Gilded Age. Um, the most important challenge to the idea of corporate ethics and capitalism is going to be the social gospel uh, as the Protestant church is going to move in cities to work to end social injustice, to work to support the lower classes, to work to uplift people. Um, they're, they're heavily focused on uh, addressing issues of poverty and economic inequality. Uh, it's gonna, they're going to argue via this ideology that poverty is not okay, that, that people aren't poor because of their, their own fault necessarily, but because society has put them in a place in which they are unsuccessful. Uh, and, and it's, the, the work of the Protestant church of the Christianity movement at the time to work to address this poverty and uplift people. Uh, social gospel is really going to be the opposite of social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is going to say, well, they're poor, leave them alone. Social gospel is going to say the ap absolute opposite. Uh, but we also see uh, some marginalized groups in society not accepting the social order either, uh, specifically women and African-Americans. We're going to see Booker T. Washington and uh, a little later, W.E.B. Du Bois pushing back on the social order of African Americans. Booker T. Washington is uh, going to work. He's going to form the Tuskegee Institute, for example, to work to, to create vocational training for African Americans uh, so that African Americans can start at the bottom of society but work their way up slowly. Over time, with a skill, uh, learning, learning a trade and then working to, to then better their family's futures. Uh, Ida B. Wells. It's going to really push back on both the, the women's side of things and the racism side of things. Uh, she's a journalist who's going to be a incredibly outspoken critic of lynching, uh, working to expose to Northern society what's happening in the South with lynching of African Americans. Uh, and then even Elizabeth Cady Stanton is going to continue her work from before the Civil War, still working for suffrage for, for women, uh, advocating for other things, for example, the idea of interracial marriage uh, being uh, legalized throughout the country. So. It's important at this point that you be able to delineate these two things, right? That there are some philosophies that justify this existing social order of the rich having all the power, the influence, and the money. Uh, those ideas like the gospel of wealth and social Darwinism. And there's uh, ideas or, or, or thinkings that push back or challenge this social order, things like the social gospel uh, and Booker T. Washington and Ida B. Wells and Elizabeth K. Stanton that are pushing back on, on this existing social order. So it's important to say, like, here's all this industrial growth. Here's things that prop that up, and here's things that try to take that down. Helpful. Now, with all this, as we talked about, uh, comes a huge amount of immigration, and then with the immigration comes urbanization. Uh, 16, almost 16 and a half million immigrants are going to come to America uh, in the 50 years, both right before the Civil War and after the Civil War, and then another eight. Now almost 9 million more are going to come the next 10 years. So that means like we're having a lot of immigrants coming and then after 1900, it, it continues just to accelerate at a very rapid rate. Now the old immigrants, as we see on this lovely chart here, uh, are going to be largely people from Northern and Western Europe, uh, people that look white, people that come from more developed countries. Uh, we're going to see Northern and Western Europe here on the green. And that's going to tail off by the 1880s and 90s, and they're going to be replaced, and then even more so, by immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, as well as Asia, Africa, and the Americans. So this new wave of immigration is going to be less white, less Protestant, less uh, politically inclined towards democracy, less understanding of capitalism as a system, uh, and much more so Southern and Eastern Europe. Asian, Catholic, Jewish, they're not going to be able to blend into American society as successfully because they look different, they sound different, they act different, they have different cultures, they embrace different philosophies in life and politics and economics. Now, this is going to lead to a ton of urban problems uh, as a lot of these immigrants are going to settle in uh, largely northern cities like New York City, Boston, and Philadelphia, and Chicago, and Detroit, San Francisco. Um, and that's going to lead to a ton of overcrowding. As the cities are unable to grow with its infrastructure enough for the amount of people that are going to live there, that's going to lead to some tenement living or people living in, in very cramped conditions with entire families, if not more so. Uh, and then we're going to see really the rise of, of urban political machines and boss politics.
as as those in cities are going to be working outside the political sphere to meet these people's needs in exchange for votes and political control. We're going to see cities become incredibly polluted, incredibly crime ridden because of poverty and high high unemployment. We're going to see cities become places where we see some of the problems that work to get addressed by the progressive era later uh, showing up, things like gambling and alcoholism and prostitution. Uh, we're going to see a, a disease being spread very quickly because of a lack of sanitation and water treatment. There's a lot of people living in a small space without any clean water or indoor plumbing or flushing toilets and all these things that aren't good. Um, so we're going to see outbreaks in cities of things like cholera and yellow fever, uh, no coronavirus. Uh, and tuberculosis, uh, so much so that by 1900, about a quarter of babies are going to die before reaching the age of one uh, in cities because of all these problems that exist with city living. Now, here's some examples that come off of a fantastic book published to try to expose some of these problems in the cities, uh, published by Jacob Rees called How the Other Half Lives, which, you know, that's a very famous picture of a whole family in this little, little uh, one-room apartment we've got going on here. Uh, and then, of course, this is going to lead to tent housing, which is an important development of the Gilded Age. As landlords are going to work to maximize their space to rent to as many people as possible to make the most money possible. Um, as, as you can see, these dumbbell tenements with a window in the middle are created to get around some restrictions um, on every bedroom having to have a window uh, so we can cram as many people in as possible. Now, overcrowding and filth in these tenements is going to just keep spreading deadly diseases. Uh, and it's going to contribute to the idea that immigrants are dirty, that, that cities are, are, are cesspools of disgustingness. When in reality, a lot of that comes from the societal setup that's here that, that funnels immigrants into places like this. Now, with this, one of the solutions to these urban problems is machine politics. Uh, political machines are going to work to bring modern services like welfare uh, for urban newcomers. These political machines are going to do things like find jobs for immigrants, uh, help a poor family with food, with groceries. Um, but then as the machine politics are working to support all these people, all they ask in return is their vote. And that's going to lead to a ton of corruption in, in urban politics as the political machines are going to solve a need for people that need resources and help, but also then by solving that need, create a whole other problem of corruption and graft uh, and, and bribery and the like as well. So these immigrants are going to face a lot of uh, uh, issues, a lot of enemies, if you will. Uh, the biggest issue is nativism, which is not a new thing. Uh, we talked a little bit about nativism in period four in, in response to the market revolution immigrants from Ireland and Germany. Um, these nativists are going to be very fearful and distrustful of foreign-born people uh, for a couple of reasons. Reason one is always this argument that immigrants are coming to take American jobs, and therefore they should not be allowed to come to America and take these jobs. Uh, but second, though, in this case is fear of the Pope. A lot of these immigrants that are coming are going to be Catholic, and there's this fear in America that the Catholics are going to be more loyal to the Pope than to the, the country. Uh, and there's this, this fear that America is a Protestant country and all these Catholics that are coming in are just diluting America's religious ideals. Uh, and the third is, is a, a fairly legitimate critique and that the people that are coming to America at this time are not familiar with uh, established political norms. Uh, they're coming much more from socialistic and anarchistic uh, societies. And that's one of the reasons why they're so prone to be taken advantage of by political machines, because they, according to the criticism, they don't understand the value of a vote and thus are trading their votes for resources, which dilutes democracy. Uh, Josiah Strong becomes a, a very influential, helpful name to have in your back pocket, uh, author who's going to be very anti-immigrant and pro-American white imperialism to take over overseas places. Uh, he publishes Our Country, which argues that in the title, it's our country and we should do our best to keep immigrants out. Now, how will we keep immigrants out? Good question. Glad you asked. Uh, first, Congress is going to pass two important immigration acts of 1882 and 1891, which are going to work to get uh, to keep convicts from coming to America, those who are considered lunatics, idiots, the diseased, or the disabled. Those are the language of the law, not mine. Don't attack me. Um, I don't think any of you are lunatics. And, and that's just going to help to try to, to purify America's immigration system. But the most important legislation passed in this time period in relation to immigration is the Chinese Exclusion Act passed in 1882, 
which is going to ban all Chinese immigration for the next 10 years. In 1892, it is renewed for 10 more years. Uh, it is eventually renewed indefinitely. And the Chinese Exclusion Act is going to stay on the books until uh, under LBJ's presidency in 1965, well, we pass immigration reform, which gets rid of quotas and all and the like. Um, now, these immigrants are going to settle in what's called ethnic neighborhoods. We see these immigrants, because they're coming from such a diverse amount of uh, diverse types of places, they're going to work to settle in places where people look like them and sound like them and act like them, where it feels a little bit more like home. Uh, it's here in the Good Old Age where we see things like Little Italy and Chinatown, which are even to this day in many big cities, uh, ethnic neighborhoods in which uh, people can settle in, have their own type of culture, their own type of community, their own type of, of society that still reminds them of home despite being in America. Uh, here, of course, is a very famous photo cartoon which uh, criticizes uh, Americans for uh, taking their hatred out on the Chinese. We see in the background uh, the idea of, of the end of, of lynching as well. So a lot of the, the racial problems that are happening in America are depicted on this uh, cartoon, which College Board loves a lot. So I thought I'd throw it up here. Cool. Now, our, our second to last thing is it deals with the West and the South. Uh, the last West, we're going to see a ton, a ton of movement out to the frontier uh, during this time period, so much so that by 1890, uh, the frontier will be closed. There will be no more unexplored, unsettled territory in the West of the United States. And a lot of this is driven by the Homestead Act. Of course, the Homestead Act is passed during period five, during the Civil War. But uh, this idea of giving land to people that want to go out to the frontier and improve that land leads a lot of people to move out west to try to farm in places like the Great Plains in South Dakota and Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, we're going to see a, ver a various amount of a, a couple different frontiers uh, that, that are explored and then exploited during this time period. The first is the mining frontier. Uh, we see a ton of silver and gold being mined in places like the Dakotas and places like Colorado and places like California. That's going to lead to a bunch of people to move out west to try to get rich mining. Uh, we're going to see the cattle frontier, largely in Texas and Oklahoma, uh, as the advancement in things like barbed wire uh, makes it much more feasible and possible to uh, corral and control cattle and thus um, to turn America into a beef eating country and America, uh, embraces, uh, beef as a business for the first time. Um, the farming frontier has been the much more common one, largely driven by the Homestead Act. Uh, as farmers are going to move out West, should I get rich that way? Uh, that's going to lead to, a, uh, farmers having a lot of problems uh, on the understanding that they're going to have issues with railroads. They're going to have issues with overproduction. They're going to have a lot of issues, uh, and they're going to form, uh, movements together to try to resolve these issues, things like the Grange that becomes the Farmers Alliance, that becomes the Populist. I'll talk about them in a little bit, but just know that that's a response to farmers' problems on the frontier. Uh, and then eventually the frontier closes in 1890, according to the census, as all of America has been explored and settled. And that leads to Frederick Jackson Turner publishing his Frontier Thesis, uh, which is a noteworthy document in that it argues that America's grown up on the frontier that America's always had a frontier and it's on the frontier where America has advanced, uh, where, where American civilization meets the savagery of the frontier. Uh, and that's where America's uh, become a more grown up country. So an important document to have in your back pocket as well. Now, getting in the way of this Western expansion is the last semblance of Indian resistance. These last Indian wars are gonna take place um, on the frontier. There's another PowerPoint on this on the website. Uh, if you want to have a little more specific on this, but just know that that the end of Native American resistance takes place in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, Helen Hunt Jackson publishes a very important book uh, titled A Century of Dishonor, in which she argues that at every single turn in American history since the beginning of American history, America's made promises and deals with Native Americans only to then turn around and break that promise on our end every single time. Uh, we see her referencing things like Andrew Jackson's Indian removal, right? Which we send the Indians to Oklahoma. Uh, and then uh, once Oklahoma becomes desired land, the, the answer is, sorry, you have to move again. You're going to lose this land and then that land and then this land. Uh, she's very critical of Americans' policies for the previous 100 years plus uh, towards Native Americans. Um, and, and one of the responses to this book is actually the Dawes Act. Um, the Dawes Act is meant to support Native Americans transitioning into a more Eurocentric white style of living in which land is given to Native Americans, uh, 
uh, formal education and schooling in things like English and Christianity is given to Native Americans. Uh, the ideology behind the Dawes Act uh, is, is kill the Indian, save the man. This idea that we should be sorry for having done all these bad things to Native Americans and we're going to make it up to them by uh, giving them a little bit of land, making them into white farmers and hoping that it all goes away. Also in the West, we see the beginnings of the conservation movement, which will become a very important development during the progressive era next, uh, as there's this beginnings of recognition that America is taking too much advantage of its natural resources and should work to conserve some of these beautiful lands out on the West. Now in the South, we're going to see the idea of a new South that's going to be championed by a very important person named Henry Grady. Uh, he's going to argue that the South should no longer live under the thumb of the North, under control by the North. They should no longer just be the raw material provider for the Northern industrial economic giant. That the South should invest in some more capitalism, some more industrialism, some more transportation, some more infrastructure. The South should get with the times and work to advance into a more productive part of society. Uh, unfortunately, this, these reforms are limited uh, to a very uh, uh, select parts of the South. Really, for, for most of the South, we see a lot of continuing of the same. Uh, there's still a ton of continued poverty uh, widespread throughout the South. Um, most of the South's economy is still based on agriculture, still based on cotton. Despite the fact that cotton prices have plummeted after the Civil War, the South is going to produce more and more and more and more cotton to try to keep their economy alive. Uh, the South is still stuck uh, with mostly Northern financing, meaning it's mostly Northern individuals and banks and businesses who are investing in the South which means they're the ones getting the profits out of the South. Uh, the South's going to embrace the system of sharecropping that I discussed at the end of Reconstruction and during period five, um, in which a very small amount of people own the land uh, and everybody else has to work the land on contracts. And the South's still going to struggle with an extreme lack of education during this time period as well. Uh, we're going to see in the South democratic control after 1877 as the, the Redeemer Democrats try to, to – undo a lot of the changes of reconstruction so politically in the south we're going to see things looking a lot more like they looked before the civil war uh in which black rights are incredibly limited uh it is a a, a white dominated political sphere uh after 1896 with plessy versus ferguson which i discussed in period five as well we see the institution of separate but equal the jim crow south uh using intimidation and things like lynching to keep uh black population subdued and using grandfather clauses literacy tests and poll taxes to ensure that African Americans do not have access to voting. So there are some changes in the New South. Birmingham, Alabama becomes an industrial center, for example. Richmond, Virginia becomes a much more industrial center. Atlanta becomes a much more industrial center. But for the uh, majority of the new, of the South, the New South is just a figment of their imagination and instead it stays much more so the same. Now the last thing to speak on real quick is politics and economics during the Gilded Age. Uh, Republicans and Democrats are going to not have strong stances on many issues in this time period. The two things that are really going to divide Republicans and Democrats that I'm going to ask you to be familiar with, the first is tariffs. Uh, Republicans are going to be the more pro-business party, so Republicans are going to be in favor of higher tariffs, where the Democrats are going to be in favor of lowering tariffs. Right? Republicans are really going to be representative of the business class, the Democrats of the working class and the agrarian class, so it shouldn't surprise us that they take these two views on tariffs. The second is currency. Uh, the Republicans, of course, because they are pro-business, are going to be in favor of the gold standard, of ensuring that all dollars that are printed are backed by an equivalent amount and value of gold. Uh, that makes dollars more valuable. So that, that means that, that people that have loaned money out when they get paid back, that they're ensured that that money is paid back with an equally invaluable currency. Uh, big business is going to be in favor of the gold standard. Uh, people that loan money, banks will be in favor of the gold standard, whereas Democrats are going to advocate by the end of this time period more bimetallism, free silver backing our dollars with gold and silver to make currency more accessible, which is going to be a popular position with the farmers, with the lower classes, with the debtors in society. As I just said. Uh, but economically speaking, one of the things you really note is that there's a huge growing gap between the rich and the poor. A couple other political issues that play a key role in the Gilded Age uh, is patronage. They did it, of course, of course, was first championed by Andrew Jackson, um, also known as the spoil system, giving jobs to your supporters simply for being loyal. Uh, this is going to be largely a Republican issue after the Civil War because it's the Republicans that are in power because of the waving the bloody shirt 
uh, strategy of asking people to vote Republican because it's Democrats that cause the civil war. So you should vote for us as Republicans. Uh, and then we can give our jobs to our supporters. We can all get rich. We can have all this corruption and nobody will care because we're in power. So patronage becomes an issue uh, that gets resolved uh, after James Garfield assassination. Uh, uh, with Chester Arthur's support and then Congress's passage of the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act, uh, which begins the process of reforming our civil service. So we're not giving out jobs to our friends, but rather giving out jobs to people who are qualified. So that's a political issue that plays a role in the Gilded Age, at least the first half. And the second is business regulation. Uh, the answer across the board for the most part is no. Both Republicans and Democrats are both going to be in favor of not regulating business for two very different reasons. Republicans, because they're pro-business, so they don't, want, they don't want to regulate their people because that would then hurt them politically. Democrats, because they believe in small government, hands-off government. So for two very different reasons, both parties will agree, with some small exceptions like the Sherman Antitrust Act, which I alluded to earlier, and the Interstate Commerce Act, which we talked about a little bit ago. Um, some small exceptions that end up being quite ineffective. Both parties will agree uh, until the very tail end of this time period with the populace that businesses are better left unregulated. Now the two other political developments that, ma that matter a lot that are worth discussing, first is political machines, these organizations that provide jobs and services to their constituents, uh, and in return they get uh, electoral support, they get votes. We're going to see political machines, uh, the best, best name to know here is Boss Tweed of New York City, uh, exerting enormous influence on the local level on politics. Now, because the Democrats and Republicans aren't that divided on most other issues, our national government is quite hands-off for the majority of this time period. Most of the things that are taking place politically are really taking place at the local level via political machines in places like New York and Philadelphia and the like. Tammany Hall with Boss Tweed in New York City is the most famous of these, eventually being taken down by the political cartoons of Thomas Nast, but in the meantime, for years and years and years, uh, exerting enormous influence on the urban uh, political uh, happenings in New York City. Uh, and then the next development is the populists. Now the populists are going to form uh, beginning in the 1880s into the 1890s, this group of people largely on the frontier in the West, uh, farmers who are upset that railroads take advantage of them, uh, that the government doesn't represent them, that they have no real recourse to change the, the governmental system around them. Uh, and their frustration is going to begin socially uh, by this feeling of, of distancing, and they're going to form the Grange social movement to work to uh, build some relations out in, in the West, in these Western states that are so spread out. Uh, this is going to lead farmers to realizing that, that there's power in numbers, much like the labor unions did, and they're going to uh, form farmers' alliances, which are going to work to set prices so that farmers can all uh, benefit. And it's going to eventually evolve into a political party called the Populist by the 1880s and 1890s. Now, what they're going to ask for uh, in what's called the Omaha Platform, know it, because College Board loves this document, the Omaha Platform of 1892, they're going to ask for more government regulation. And this is going to set them apart from the Republicans and the Democrats, because both the Republicans and Democrats, as we just talked about last slide, are in favor of less government regulation. So they're going to increase government regulation, specifically on what they see as public utilities, things that all the public need. So railroads, for example. Uh, the populists are going to ask for the federal government to actually take over and run railroads as, as a common good that benefits all people. So they want bigger government, increased government regulation. Uh, they, as farmers who are largely poor, are going to ask for the coinage of silver or bimetallism is the, the phrase to know there, uh, and that our money should be backed by gold and silver so the farmers can have their hands on more currency, more readily accessible. Uh, they're going to ask for the direct election of senators. At the time still, we see the state legislators picking their senators. Uh, in these small western states that have a very small population, they recognize that their House of Representatives, which are based on population, they have very little influence there because they have such a small amount of people in their states. So the real power for these less populated states is in the Senate, where every state gets two senators. And therefore, if that's the real place in which our state, places like Nebraska and Colorado and Wyoming, if, the, if that's where those smaller population-wise states can have their influence, then that's where they should be able to pick those people directly. So they're going to ask for the direct election of senators. Uh, support for farmers, help for farmers, aid for farmers, um, and they're going to ask to make democracy more democratic with three things that are going to become a, a bigger issue later in the progressive era, uh, initiative, referendum, and reform. Basically just the idea that if people want something changed, they should be able to vote on it directly 
change it directly without hoping that the representative six steps above them make those changes for them. So the populists are going to run a presidential candidate in 1892. Uh, they're going to win some control from state legislatures and be a very successful third party. Um, in 1896, the Democrats are actually going to adopt many of the ideas of the populists, therefore making the populists basically worthless because they're just a third party. Now the Democrats have taken a lot of their ideas, but this is going to really start beginning the transition for the Democratic Party to begin embracing more big government social reform changes for the people, which takes us into the 20th century much more effectively. So there is that election in 1896, um, a perfect place to end the Gilded Age. Uh, the Republicans, as the pro-business party, are going to run for presidency William McKinley. Uh, he's very pro-business, uh, very pro-business. He has a huge campaign budget. In terms of the percentage of how much he spends on the campaign versus how much money there is in America, it's the most expensive campaign in American history by a, by a long shot. And a lot of this campaign is funded by big business who wants to see McKinley win. He promises high tariffs. He promises a return to the gold standard. Uh, and he runs against William Jennings Bryan, a very important dude. William Jennings Bryan uh, is a Democrat who's going to adopt a lot of the populist ideas uh, like bimetallism. Uh, he makes a very famous cross of gold speech in which he, he says very eloquently, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold, which you see alluded to here in this cartoon, in which he's arguing that, that this, the gold standard is actually killing human society by allowing only the rich to have access to currency. He's going to appeal to farmers. He's going to appeal to the working class. He's going to appeal to the middle class workers and the laborers. And the Democrats are going to widen their base and embrace big government and regulation of railroads and all these things. And then McKinley is going to win by a whole hell of a lot. So we see here at the end of this Gilded Age time period, um, the pro-business interests, the pro-big money interests win a landslide election in 1896. McKinley follows this up by uh, passing an incredibly high tariff, by conducting the Spanish-American War uh, to create more markets for the U.S., by putting the U.S. back on the gold standard, so by doing just what big business would have wanted. Uh, it's a perfect place to end this time period because it really demonstrates the limits of reform uh, when the reform is trying to be done by the people on the ground level. So that's that does it for period six. The things that I want to make sure that we're good on is the effects of industrialization, is the shortcomings of the labor unions, is the uh, causes and consequences for this huge increase in immigration, uh, as well as these political developments that lead us to a point which ends the third party system uh, as the Democrats are going to, to leave their small government roots and begin embracing uh, bigger government and reform and change. So that's period six. We'll get period seven up here for you shortly. Have a fantastic day. I hope that that was helpful. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you next time.